in this color if you don't if you don't have that uh, try to get one later I'm going to take you through it since I have uh, maybe uh, maybe 15 probably 10 minutes and I'm going to take you through this document that's what I'll be doing and I'll be just summarizing it uh, briefly uh, one of the first things that uh, we did was in a sense try to get a definition of genocide that took care of some of the problems that the 1948 definition had encountered when people in the United States government, in the UN, in Doctors Without Borders, and in numerous NGOs and Amnesty International encountered the problem of Darfur. Uh, there were many reasons, given the, the legal way that that was worded, to just avoid uh, calling it genocide uh, uh, and so forth. So we've got a definition uh, on this document that is the one that I think moves people and that will move people despite all the loose ends. Uh, in that kind of document. It's one designed to uh, have you make up your own mind and a kind of moral independence. Uh, do you think it's genocide or not? Genocide can be defined as bringing about the radical diminution of a people and their culture by means of mass killing and usually mass expulsion. That's it. And the question of intent, which has hung up so many people, in fact, we deal with in a military way by saying, if you were in command and had the power to stop some action, and you did not do it, you are therefore guilty of the consequences of that failure to stop it. That's the way we've operated with it. I also have a definition of ending the genocide, which I'd like to see us debate. Uh, the genocide can be considered ended when the victim group can freely choose between returning to the area from which they were expelled or building a new life somewhere else. Second, the security situation, especially the threat to civilians, is similar to that obtaining before the genocide began. I'm not talking about returning to a total peace, the peace of a cemetery or the peace of Switzerland. I'm talking about a condition that existed before the genocide began. The third condition is a large proportion of the victim population has the capability to seek justice. That capability being essential to living a truly human life. Listen to the number of times today that justice has been used. And of course, it's the first word in the justice and equality movement. That's the goal. What constitutes justice, however, is a matter that people should work out by themselves talking to other people. We all have a responsibility for justice as well. And then uh, a good part of, the, uh, of this paper uh, talks about uh, the problem with the American government. And the argument is that, in fact, the American government has, in a sense, uh, always held action to end the Darfur and Nuba Mountain and other Sudan genocides as secondary, secondary to the goal for which people are engaged, and that is protecting the national interest of the United States as it is defined. And in practice, that national interest has been defined as giving a high valuation to the allegedly important information about terrorists that Khartoum and the Bashir government have been giving to the United States since about 2002. This was discovered in 2005, more or less. So that, that's the reason they get that stuff. They have also, in fact, the American government has not only protected Khartoum, it has also engaged uh, Khartoum in a number of joint operations and the way they have dealt with uh, people who've been under extraordinary rendition or have been taken to investigate somewhere to be investigated and then we need to do something with these people. We decided they weren't terrorists. What are we going to do with them? They sent them to Sudan. So there is a cooperative arrangement between the United States government and the government of Sudan, the genocidal government of Sudan. On the other hand, that's not so different from uh, the way that the United States government has operated in the past in other genocides. So uh, that's also included in this uh, blue document, which you'll find an elaborated version of on a website of the Darfur Action Group, Cornell. So let me, let me then turn to uh, the matter of what are we going to do about it, all right? And I should say here that I am operating in a, a non-humanitarian mode. Uh, I'm operating in a human rights mode uh, as well uh, today. And Mark can testify to the fact that I do also do humanitarian projects as well uh, to help Sudan. Therefore, I'm suggesting that, in fact, we do various things and we advocate various things. One is, and what, what we keep in mind, however, is that this is not going to be solved unless we can move beyond the United States and a focus on American policy. 
It's the reason that the Darfur Action Group uh, rode their bicycles up from Ithaca to Ottawa in 2005, 632 miles, 24, uh, 25, something like that, uh, media you know, units and so forth. Anyway, okay. You've got to go somewhere else. You've got to get the internationals, other people, other countries that are not so hung up on, the, uh, on their definition of how to act in the war on terrorism. You've got to get them involved as well. And you've also got to build movements that will be able to move those governments uh, to do various things. So what uh, the Darfur Action Group did was suggest, OK, why don't you then take Canadians and go to the European Union and asked the European <coughs> Union to set up a study commission. And the idea was that that, uh, that study commission would look and it would identify who were the real actors who needed to be represented in some kind of a meeting to settle the form of a, a government and to implement uh, the, uh, the, the agreements about that form. All right, so, and we've got signatures on that from a number of distinguished Canadians, former members of parliament, current serving members of parliament, General Romeo Dallaire, uh, the leader of the UN forces in Rwanda, uh, Steve Lewis, a well-known humanitarian uh, who led the uh, battle against AIDS, you might say. These people signed that, uh, that proposal, but what happened to it is uh, still something of a mystery. In any case, uh, it has not yet been uh, really uh, reacted to by the European Union. The idea was all we're asking the European Union to do is just stick up some money. Uh, and then these folks would do a very thorough job of what has already been occurring, but only partially, in investigating who really is the civil society, who should represent. One of the things that I think this group would, would certainly conclude, this study commission, is that, well, we have many Arabs, many Arab citizens of Sudan who indeed have to be included in this and would be able to do it, uh, would be able to contribute as well. Uh, that uh, that whole uh, category hasn't been talked about too much this morning and this afternoon. But these are people who are, after all, they're a good part of uh, the Sudanese population. They would be included. Okay, so what do you do? Well, you have a list of names. You have a list of people that you want to invite to a uh, conference. This, by the way, was done in the case of Afghanistan in 2001, November 2001. Uh, uh, Lakhta Brahimi uh, chose the people to come to that conference. They came to the conference and in two weeks they had a constitution. Then they went back and they had to implement the constitution. Uh, think what you will about the results in Afghanistan now, and some of you are of course not satisfied. Afghanistan has not become a Switzerland or a Canada. But ask in fact a woman or a Hazara minority member if uh, they are in a better situation now in uh, the year 2013 than they were back in 2001 under the Taliban. Ask them that question, you might get some idea why there are possibilities to a kind of Afghan uh, approach perhaps. So of course we'd try to do it better than uh, was done before. So that would be part of the idea. Now, how do you get this meeting going? You get this meeting going, that's where the rub comes in. You get a coalition of the willing who are ready to use armed force to extract people from Sudan to a meeting somewhere. I don't know where. Uh, Durban, South Africa is one of the places we looked at. Got nice conference facilities. Anyway, I'm another as good as this one. But anyway, uh, that kind of thing. All right, so you would do that. They would be extracted there. They would then, and by the way, you'd have all kinds of people. You'd have, in fact, the uh, Rizegat, uh, other uh, tribes. You might even have Um Jalul clan of Musa Hilal would come to that. They would, of course, walk out. And they would be busy, in fact, uh, talking to Khartoum about what was going on and trying to disrupt it. Nevertheless, they would have been there. All right. You have your constitution. You have your agreement, which is already, of course, there and what was discussed by uh, the members of our different opponent groups today. A lot of those elements are, are there as well. Then you have to implement that constitution. You have to go back and say, all right, we're going to establish security for this kind of true federalism, this true democratic federalism with self-determination of the regions that we're going to put in practice. All right, how do you do that? Well, you have armed troops go in in a phased way and, in fact, uh, make sure that, they, uh, that we expel all security elements uh, of uh, Khartoum from the various areas from the rest of the country. So that's one possibility. And then, of course, they help maintain security from bandits and from, uh, you know, John Jaweed who didn't agree with, the, uh, with the, uh, what happened at the meeting, this kind of thing. Okay, so that's, that's, uh, that's the project that's called the Afghan Model Project as one possibility. 
takes a lot of work, takes international work, takes looking away from uh, the United States Congress, which has been pretty helpless in doing anything and hasn't really done anything to affect the administration's, both administrations, both Bush and Obama's administration, determined not to let anything interfere with their intelligence feed in from Khartoum and with their cooperative arrangements having to do with the war on terror. Uh, therefore, you've got to get away from that, get to some other countries, but not totally give up on recruiting perhaps some supporters. After all, uh, there had been support uh, suggested for, uh, um, for Darfur by uh, Senator Obama as well. Okay, the next proposal that the, uh, the Cornell Group suggests is a no-fly zone. I would say that the no-fly zone, by the way, that's something you do need to look at the uh, website for to look at the details because the group has filed uh, three different reports, one uh, full length, it took me a whole summer, in fact, to write uh, on no-fly zones, all right, and how they can operate in various ways based upon their history. All right, no-fly zone. One of the problems with no-fly zones is simply that you need a clear mission, a clear termination date, or the military will cooperate. They don't like ones that just sort of sit there and degrade. So they have to have a clear mission uh, as well, and they, it can be otherwise implemented. To write this last report, we consulted seven military officials and experts, including one general. We also included seven civilian experts and could talk to them. So that's possible, but you need to bring in also the lessons of uh, Libya and the lessons also for to provide comfort in northern Iraq. What that means is that you need to look at the question of no drive zones, because that's in fact what would happen. That's what happened in Libya. It wasn't just a no-fly zone. When the uh, Qaddafi's tanks were moving east toward Benghazi, it, they were hit, uh, even though they weren't flying. Okay, so that's, uh, that's uh, one uh, proposition. Another proposition on there uh, that hasn't been followed up on is one that was suggested in hearings in front of uh, the late Representative Donald Payne, which is to, in fact, build a robust air defense capability in South Sudan. A fourth proposition was direct support to rebel groups. Uh, I'm not talking about, you know, C rations and K rations and, and uh, meals ready to eat and that kind of stuff, but actual serious support, including guns, weapons, that kind of stuff. Okay, the next, uh, uh, the next kind of proposals we have on the list that you, you will be looking at, uh, get a chance to look at someday, I hope, are intermediate proposals that don't really promise a near-term ending to the genocide, but worth looking at. Uh, pro proposal number six, the establishment of a memorial museum of Sudanese crimes where people can actually put themselves on the record as well. Uh, I mean a building, I don't mean a country in the United States. I suspect the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum would never allow that kind of thing. Uh, uh, and it would not be allowed in the United States. Nevertheless, put it out there. And have, we have some countries in mind, by the way, and we can talk about others. All right, so you've got a memorial. What does that do? Well, it promotes the idea. It tells the story of all the Sudanese who have suffered from Khartoum. And it uses the inventiveness. I hope they would put Mark Hackett on the board of their sort of deployment of videos as well. Not only that, but refugees and victims will get a chance to have their story recorded on a Skype interview that ends up on a tape and ends up in the file. That's been done, of course, at Yale and also by the Memorial Museum itself. Okay, number seven idea is one that you could do with lobbying uh, tomorrow afternoon, and that's to show that you have a little power to influence policy by landing on Senator Robert Menendez, who is the main reason that we have not barred the import of gum Arabic from Sudan. And the cartoon government loves to brag about the fact that we will not abandon our soda pop, as they put it. Anyway, and the reason that we will not abandon our soda pop has to do with the lobbies, so the sugar lobbies, and the soda pop lobbies that talk to Senator Menendez. So that's a target for you. Okay, uh, there are a couple of other interesting observations I think you'll find at the, at the end of that at the end of that, uh, uh, this document, and we're going to post it on a place. It's a little tough to write it down. I wish I had uh, sort of brought my laptop, put it up on the board, because it's a sort of a strange website. WW, it's actually a, originally a family website, weaversofthewind.org. Weavers of the Wind. You know, that's my living, right? I talk, I teach, I weave the wind, you know. I got a brother who's a minister, he talks, weaves the wind, got teachers. That's the idea, so that's one way to remember. Weavers, plural, of the wind, dot org. Okay. I don't know where I am on time. But anyway. Thank you, Mark, for letting me go over it. Right. Over.
Um, next, we're going to hear from uh, Paul Slovic. Uh, he's going to talk about um, issues a lot of times we don't think about, um, such as things like psychic numbing and um, why large groups of people don't always act when cases of genocide break out. Uh, it's an extremely fascinating topic. I think you're going to find it very interesting. Thank you. I'm, I'm honored to be here. Uh, I'm going to go rather quickly, uh, but uh, whatever I talk about is there's uh, written material I'm happy to provide. Uh, I'm going to talk about the human mind. Uh, the uh, genocide starts in the mind of the perpetrator, and it continues in the minds of people who turn their backs on it. So I'm going to focus on that latter half as a psychologist to try to help us uh, think about uh, who we are and why we, uh, why we uh, let this kind of thing happen. Elie Wiesel, survivor of the Holocaust, uh, railed against indifference. He said, indifference to me is the epitome of evil, yet the world is too often indifferent to genocide. Why is that the case? Uh, modern psychology, some of you may have seen this book. It sold a million copies last year by Nobel Prize winner Daniel Kahneman, a psychologist, about thinking fast and slow. And he talks about uh, the fact that uh, the way we think, we have two ways of thinking. One's a fast, intuitive gut feeling. The other is slow, careful, thoughtful deliberation. And, uh, and the main message of this talk is that you know, most of the time we operate on the fast system because it's easy, but we can't trust it. Uh, and it's more, you know, that's what moral intuition is. It's a fast, intuitive uh, take on something. We can't trust it to fa guide us in the face of genocide. We need slow, careful thinking, moral judgment to create adequate laws, institutions, and political mechanisms to prevent a genocide. So that's the main message. Mother Teresa famously said, if I look at the mass, I'll never act. If I look at one, I will. Uh, this illustrates a, a powerful and unsettling uh, insight into human nature. Most people are caring and will exert great effort to rescue the one whose, one of, whose needy plight comes to their attention. But the same good people often become numbly indifferent to the plight of the one who's one of many in a much greater problem. Why is this? If we can answer it, maybe it'll help us answer the question, why do good people ignore genocide and other human and environmental catastrophes? So there's something called a singularity effect. It just means we place great value on saving individual lives. Uh, I collect stories from our local newspaper that illustrate Mother Teresa's uh, point about caring. These are the guy on the, on the right rescued the guy on the left whose truck went into a lake. At great risk to himself, he jumped in, saved this guy. Uh, but it doesn't have to be a human. An animal fell through the ice in one of our lakes in Oregon, and people came to its rescue. Uh, a dog uh, uh, was stranded on a ship lost in the Pacific. We spent $300,000 to rescue this dog. Um, opposite this singularity is psychic numbing. So, so in Rwanda, 800,000 people were murdered, uh, and the world knew about it and, uh, and did nothing. And of course, uh, Samantha Power and others have documented repeated instances of, of uh, genocides uh, to which we underreacted. Richard Just, uh, uh, talking about uh, Darfur a few years ago, said, we are awash in information about Darfur. No genocide has ever been so thoroughly documented while it was taking place but the genocide con continues. We document what we do not stop. The truth does not set anybody free. How could we have known so much and done so little? That was uh, four and a half years ago, and the situation's the same. We're still doing a little. We value individual lives greatly in some circumstances. In other ca contexts, our actions impute little or no value to human life. Is this what we want? Who are we? Which of these uh, kinds of people are we? Uh, well, why do we ignore this? Well, there's no simple answer. I don't pretend, uh, you know, anything that is so goes against the grain of, you know, uh, of a civilized society must have multiple ca uh, causes, and these are all the causes, uh, at least, probably not even complete. Uh, you know, it's dangerous, costly, and difficult to intervene in genocide, uh, and so on. I focus on the bottom one, the available information fails to convey uh, affect, which is kind of, you know, emotion, and uh, which, is, which is important. So now I ask the question, what's the difference between moral intuition and moral judgment? Well, intuition is this fast, automatic, non-conscious response like perception. Judgment is slow, deliberative, thoughtful. This is the slow thinking of Kahneman. 
We know that moral intuition usually dominates moral judgment unless we make an effort to use judgment to critique and, if necessary, override intuition. Intuition is like perception. Uh, visual perception is sophisticated and remarkably accurate, but it's sub, uh, sub perception subject to powerful and systematic biases. We illustrate these with visual illusions. The guy on uh, the, the figure on, on the right looks larger than the, uh, than the figure on the left, uh, but they're all the same height. This situation fools the eye. As good as it is, the eye is deceived. Well, our moral intuitions, like our visual perceptions, are sophisticated, accurate, and sometimes wrong. Our moral intuitions fail us in the face of genocide and other crises where the scale of the problem is great and direct emotion-creating experiences are lacking. Uh, there we have to use moral reasoning to, to appreciate it. So questions, how should we value a human life? How do we value a human life? Well, uh, we might say that if, you, if we think that basically every human life is equally worth protecting, as the number of lives increase, uh, the value should increase linearly, on the, like on the left. Or maybe uh, if it threatens, the large number threatens the viability of a culture or society as in genocide, the next life lost is even more valuable than the one uh, before it. So these are kind of normative models, rational models. How, uh, but our actions in the face of mass murder don't follow either of these normative models because our feelings override our uh, analytic judgments. Our feelings are insensitive to large losses of life. Uh, and we identify through research two types of descriptive models which are non-rational. One is uh, on the left, uh, the psychophysical model. It starts out very strong reaction and then it kind of num numbs out. The other starts out high and then collapses. Uh, this psychophysical perception underlies the way we react to sensory phenomena like heaviness, pain, and so forth, money, and unfortunately, it, acts, it, it affects the way we react to lives when we are thinking fast. Uh, so uh, how can we study it? We do experiments. Uh, this was an experiment that we did after uh, Rwanda where people who uh, were fleeing to refugee camps in what was then Zaire, they were dying from cholera, they didn't have clean water. So we propose to people, supposing you're an official of a neighboring country, you have enough money to send pumping equipment uh, to provide clean water that could save the lives of 4,500 people in one of these camps, okay? But we varied then the size of the camp, and what we found is that people were more willing to save 4,500 lives in a small camp, 11,000, than in a large camp of 250,000. This is the psychophysical reaction. Going from 250 to 245,000, is on, you're on the flat part of the curve. Going from 11 to 5, you're on the steep part. It seems bigger when, in fact, uh, it's the same. It's an illusion, just like that visual illusion. It's wrong. Uh, but, that's, but, but it implies, oops. Um, OK. Um, it implies that we'll act. Even though it's flat, you know, it's above zero. But, uh, but why don't we act? Well, there's another function that we find evidence for, a collapse fu function. You start out caring, and as the number gets great, suddenly you lose it. You don't care anymore. Uh, you know, conveying the statistics of mass murder and genocide, no matter how large the numbers, fails to convey the true meaning of such atrocities. Uh, you can say that statistics are human beings with the tears dried off. So how might we put the tears back on? Well, you can try to do it with images, narratives, personalized stories, and, fi and faces. So a class in Tennessee tried to grasp the number six million of the Holocaust by collecting six million paper clips. Uh, in, at Oregon, we put uh, flags on the, on the lawn to illustrate the uh, number of American and Iraqi uh, war dead, the red flags being American, the white being Iraqi dead, going as far as you can see. People were struck by that as they walked through campus. Charities know uh, this. They, they highlight a single child that you can save. Uh, it doesn't, uh, uh, Schindler, uh, Steven Spielberg in the movie Schindler's List, uh, it was a black and white movie, but there was one color image in the whole movie. He colored the coat of this little girl to try to get away from just the mass of, of things, to, to highlight an individual here. Uh, Nicholas Kristof, when he read in one of my papers about the, uh, about the puppy, wrote the col uh, uh, column, uh, Save the Darfur Puppy. He said, if only there was a cute puppy uh, endangered in Darfur, maybe we would do something about it. The fact that there are millions of people doesn't seem to move us. Strange uh, way of our human psychology. But there might be a limit to the ability of faces and stories uh, even to prevail over numbers. 
So we do another experiment. We give people the opportunity to donate money to a starving child in Mali, Rokia on the right. Um, a second group could, we tell them about the statistics of starvation in several African countries, millions starving. A third group could again donate to the little girl, but they see the statistics right next to her like you see it there. They had five dollars uh, to donate. Uh, 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 the, uh, oops, it's not coming through. So, so they look at the little girl, they give half their money, two dollars and thirty-eight cents. They look at the statistics, they give a dollar fourteen. Uh, they look at uh, the uh, uh, the girl, again, they donate to the girl, but the numbers are right by her face, hardly different from the dollar fourteen. So putting the numbers, uh, the large numbers next to the girl, diminishes the reaction to the girl. Uh, maybe uh, maybe uh, we, we seem to, to uh, uh, be demotivated by the fact that there's so many people we're not helping. But it's not just large numbers that interfere with feelings. We le attend less carefully to groups than we do to individuals and we donate less to groups. So here's a study out of Israel. People had a chance to donate to children who were in a, being treated uh, for cancer in a hospital. Eight children, uh, they need $300,000 for treatment. Would you donate? Uh, and then they saw, uh, another, other groups saw individual children taken from the picture. This child needs 300,000. Would you donate? And how much? We see that the individual children get much higher donations than the, than the group. When we saw that, we decided to do a parallel experiment. We, with uh, Rokia and a little boy, Musa. A group could donate either to, to one group to Rokia, one to Musa, one, the money would go to Rokia and Musa. And, um, well, this isn't coming through on this. Thing. But anyway, the story is that, that the donations dropped for the, for the two. It was less for the two than for the individuals. So if you start to lose it at number two, no wonder it's gone when there's 400,000 is the number that's staring at, at you. Okay, this is a nice psychological story. So what? Uh, what might be done about psychic numbing and genocide? You can think about the near term for Sudan and the long term for humanity. Very quickly, uh, I think we understanding this, this feelings versus reason and the fact that we can't trust our moral intuitions, we need to design a procedures, laws, and institutions with slow thinking to combat psychic numbing. And there's a paper that uh, I, I put a, a example copy out in the lobby, which I'm happy to send people, which tries to uh, 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 introduce some, uh, some uh, implications, just the beginning of thinking, well, if we take psychic numbing seriously, what does it mean for law and policy? So uh, very quickly, I mean, it means we need to insul insulate institutions from the effects of this by constructing default rules and pre-commitment de devices in our moments of slow thinking. Emphasize early warning and prevention before the numbers get so big that they numb us. Empower institutions and actors less likely to succumb to numbing. Well, those are probably the regional people. The people who are closer to the, to the problem will be uh, more sensitive to it than those of us who are thousands of miles away. Uh, remove or restrict institutional features that foster numbing. If one is change the method of reporting. Just don't give the statistics, the numbers. Make them graphic, you know, vivid, you know, if it's rape, Describe the rapes, have those, you know, be more vivid in, in emotional statistics. Revise the law to protect, protect individuals, not collectives, because we respond more strongly to uh, individuals. Uh, employ emotion and affect uh, to activate and support this slow thinking through uh, more vivid imagery, empower victims to tell their story and engage us emotionally, uh, social media, and uh, one uh, interesting device would be to expose the perpetrator. And there is research that shows that uh, an identified uh, perpetrator gets more uh, uh, response. So why is it that uh, we responded to, uh, to Gaddafi and went after Gaddafi, but we, never, we don't do it with Bashir? Well, no one in this country except you people know about uh, Bashir. When I speak to audiences, maybe there's hundreds of people in the audience, have you ever, do you know the name of this guy, who he is? No one has ever heard of him. He flies under the radar. Uh, Gaddafi was a known villain. He didn't have people protecting him, and so we were able to go after him. So this, show, this exposes the, 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 uh, the, the problem with the system. It shouldn't depend on the personality and the visibility of, of the perpetrator whether or not we, we act against them. Uh, that's uh, not the way to do it. And so I've got an article out there on the, in the hall about, uh, about this. Be political, uh, the Numa Mountains. Uh, so in January of 2000, got one more minute. Uh, January of 2012, uh, uh, 
Princeton Lyman of the, the U.S. Envoy, you know, said, you know, there's a lot of starvation happening here, hundreds of thousands of people, we have to do something about it. A, few, a number of months later, a number of the uh, genocide scholars wrote to Obama uh, uh, urging him to do something about this problem, and we got a reply from, from the same guy, Lyman, this is months later, saying, oh, well, we told the government, we have been doing something, we told them to stop it, we passed a resolution, they really did nothing. So knew about it, they did nothing. Um, uh, so uh, why is this uh, going on? Incidentally, um, there's a, a, a woman in our town uh, who was married to a Sudanese man. He was arrested in Sudan, and, uh, and uh, it was front page news, which our, the paper never talks about Sudan, New, New Mountains, except when it's an individual with a local connection. And interesting, again, it was Princeton Lyman when he was released who hugs the man, the individual, the man who turns away from the hundreds of thousands, or you know, not that he could by himself change it, but now when it's one person, uh, it's easier and more Im important to act. So um, one last, uh, last thing, and why is it that our government, which knows so much about this, is doing so little? And the rhetoric from the Obama administration is very powerful about we have to go in you know, to, uh, to stop this, and yet we do nothing. Uh, there are probably many reasons. I'm not the best person to answer this question, but one hypothesis is that, that uh, the government of Sudan is giving us information about terrorists. Uh, national security trumps human rights. So if we, you know, we don't want to, to, uh, to jeopardize the possibility we may learn something about terrorists uh, just because there's hundreds of thousands of people uh, at, at risk. So conclusion, at this point, the implications of this psychological account, psychic numbing, need to be aggressively and creatively merged with legal and political realities. If we don't uh, counter psychic numbing, then we can uh, face another century of mass murder and genocide. Uh, and a uh, hundred years from now, another Samantha Power will come on and tell us about all the genocides that uh, took place uh, in this century that we uh, turned our back on. Thank you very much. Dr. Paul Slovic's pathbreaking experiments show us that human beings cannot comprehend or feel sympathy for the murder or suffering of large groups of people in places like Sudan or Rwanda of different races halfway around the world. And he calls this phenomenon psychic numbing. The more victims, the less compassion. So what can we do about it? In 30 years of work against genocide, I've learned six lessons about genocide prevention. The first lesson is that the best defense is self-defense. South Sudan is independent today because the SPLA fought the Sudanese army to a draw, and Sudan wanted to share South Sudan's oil wealth. The lesson, the US the UK and other military powers should arm and support the SPLM and JEM and other carefully chosen groups in their struggle to overthrow the genocidal regime of Omar al-Bashir. <clears throat> Bashir's regime is a Nazi-like regime guided by the racist doctrines of the Arab gathering which holds that Arabs are a superior race and black Africans have no rights in Sudan. In fact, they are slaves. If only more people in America and Europe understood that this is the fundamental ideology of this regime, I think we would have an entirely different mentality toward it. It's a criminal gang. And they're now on their fourth genocide. The first killed two and a half million people in South Sudan, and then tens of thousands of Nuba in the 1990s, and the second, then at least 350,000 Darfuris, and now tens of thousands more in the Nuba Mountains and Blue Nile. I mean, how many times do they have to commit genocide before we figure out what they're up to? This regime, which has murdered over three million of its own citizens has no legitimacy at all. Abye and South Kordofan should be freed to join South 
Sudan. And when, when the so-called comprehensive peace agreement was reached, and it wasn't comprehensive at all, they were supposed to have a referendum in Abyei, if you'll remember, but then the Sudanese army drove all of the Dinka out of Abyei, and so if you had a referendum now, of course, it would completely uh, be invalid because uh, they drove out the people who were the original inhabitants there, including, by the way, Francis Deng, our former UN Special Advisor for the Prevention of Genocide. He's from there. Um, the second lesson I've learned is that because individuals cannot maintain their sympathy, we need permanent institutions, and Paul was alluding to this, that we'll watch out for precursors of genocide and take action to prevent it, intervene to stop it, and arrest and pr prosecute those who commit it. That's why we have governments. These are permanent institutions to deal with the ongoing problems that we as individuals cannot deal with. Institutions are necessary to overcome the fleeting nature of our concern. And that's why in 2000, Genocide Watch proposed and the International Alliance to End Genocide lobbied. And in 2004, the UN Special uh, Secretary General created the UN Special Advisor for the Prevention of Genocide. It's why we support President Obama's U.S. Atrocities Prevention Board and the creation of similar institutions in Britain, France, Germany, India, Nigeria, and other nations around the world. But we've been stunned and shocked that since its creation, the Atrocities Prevention Board has refused to divulge the contact information for any of its members, even to organizations like Genocide Watch and the International Association of Genocide Scholars, both of whom are dedicated to early warning and prevention of genocide. Sounds a little strange, doesn't it? But I would say this. We know from the Rwandan crisis that early warning is not enough. The third lesson is that we must create institutions for action. Unfortunately, President Obama has not matched his promise of never again with any concrete action to stop the Sudanese government's genocide in the Nuba Mountains, Blue Nile, and Darfur. Nor did President Bush. President Obama should impose a massive, passive, understand that word, I, I underline it, passive, no-fly zone over the Nuba Mountains, Blue Nile, and Darfur. And by that, I mean this. Our objective is not to kill Sudanese pilots. What we would do is we'd wait until any Sudanese bomber or helicopter gunship that attacks a civilian village would land, and then when their crews have left the planes at night, the planes would be destroyed by cruise missiles fired from American warships in the Indian Ocean, or they would be blown up by Hellfire missiles fired from Predator drones. And then we'd blow up their runways. NATO airstrikes in Libya took control of the skies from Gaddafi. And the same should be done in al-Bashir, Sudan. The UN has completely failed to prevent or stop genocide, largely because of a paralysis by threatened vetoes by one or more of the permanent members of the Security Council, and also because of the UN Secretary General's continuing unwillingness to offend member states. It's a I'm not against the UN. It's a very important organization. We should have it because of the World Health Organization and the Universal Postal Union and all the other good things that the UN does. But as an agency to prevent genocide, it's been a total failure. It has never yet prevented a single genocide. So to prevent it or to stop it, you have to rely on regional alliances like ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States, led by Nigeria, by NATO, by ASEAN, which stopped the East Timor genocide, 
and the OAS, which basically convinced Nicaragua to pull its troops back out of Costa Rica, which doesn't even have an army, simply by diplomacy, all of which were effective interveners in those cases. The UN Charter, in fact, specifically authorizes regional intervention. The fourth lesson is that we need effective punishment for genocide and crimes against humanity. Although al-Bashir, Ahmed Haroun, and Ali Kutaib have been charged by the International Court by one of my personal heroes, this man right here, The ICC, unfortunately, still has no police force of its own to enforce its warrants to arrest these people. The statute of the International Criminal Court needs an optional protocol creating an international police force with the sole mandate to arrest leaders charged by the ICC. The police force could be created without any action at all by the UN through a convention among the Assembly of States Parties to the ICC. It should be done and we should begin doing it now. A fifth lesson is that genocide and war will not end until all women are educated and empowered. This, folks, is the elephant in the room. Not a single genocide in world history has ever been planned by women. Not one. Now, when you consider that 50% of the population in the world is women, that's kind of extraordinary, isn't it? It is not as though women are, you know, can't be tempted into being part of a genocide or maybe even part of the conspiratorial group as they were in Rwanda, for instance, uh, or the Nazi uh, guards in some of the camps and so forth. But not one genocide, not one in world history has ever been planned by women. It's astonishing. And if you think about it as a social scientist, and I am, I'm an anthropologist, you almost have to wonder if there isn't something hardwired here. You know, is it because men have different ways of handling conflict? that we have some kind of different hormonal structure, that we have needs for turf protection that are different than women's, that women have different ways of dealing with conflict and that different ways of collaborating? I don't know for sure. But this is a subject that really deserves a lot of research. And I do believe, if you take a look at the countries where half of the legislators are women, places like Sweden, like Rwanda and other places like that, the risk of genocide has gone down to a very small percentage of what it used to be. So I emphasize that, and it isn't just because one of my ancestors happened to be the founder of the women's suffrage movement in America. <laughs> Good old Liz. And the final <laughs> lesson that I would leave with you is that genocide prevention must start and be led at the local level by people in the countries ruled by tyranny. It cannot be led by American or European organizations or by international organizations sitting in New York or national governments in Washington, D.C. or London. And we've just heard why. Because they operate on national interest models. Prevention must begin from the ground up in countries at risk of genocide. The purpose of Act for Sudan and the International Alliance to End Genocide should be to support such local efforts and create an international mass movement to end genocide. The best example I can leave with you is Liberia. And you can see a film about it made by Abigail Disney called Pray the Devil Back to Hell. It was written up in a, by a columnist for the New York Times. Lima Gabawi, a fish seller in Monrovia, one who didn't even have a secondary school education, had a strange dream one night. She dreamed that the market women of Monrovia should begin each week with an hour of prayer for peace in Liberia. 
a country then torn apart by civil war between Charles Taylor's government and the Revolutionary uh, United Front, or RUF, R-U-F. Both sides were cutting off arms and hands, raped women, conscripted child soldiers, and turned them into killers on drugs. And they committed every war crime imaginable. Well, Lima Gabawi told her dream to a Muslim friend who also sold fish in that same market. Together, they began weekly prayer meetings in the fish market. More and more women joined until 5,000 women were praying every week. Charles Taylor's entourage would glide by blithely in their Mercedes limousines and laugh at these crazy women who were praying in the fish market. And then Lima Gabawe and the other women demanded a meeting with Charles Taylor and with the leaders of the RUF. And the women met Charles Taylor in public. You've got to see this in the movie to believe it. Lima Gabawi confronted him directly. I mean, it is an amazingly dramatic scene. And she specifically asked him if he would be willing to actually resign if it would bring peace to Liberia. And he said he would. They demanded an immediate ceasefire and negotiations to end the war. Both Taylor and the RUF agreed, and the talks began in a Ghana, in a five-star hotel, of course. But the women didn't trust the men. And so they pooled their nickels and their quarters, and they rented buses, and they went to a cry themselves. They slept outside, sometimes in the rain, while the men slept in their hotels. And the talks between the men, led by a very distinguished former Nigerian president went nowhere. Finally, fed up, the women walked into the building where the talks were underway and sat down in the hallways. The Ghanaian police threatened to arrest them. One of the senior women said she would make it easy for them by removing all her clothes. One of the most humiliating things for an African man is for her, a grandmother to disrobe in front of him. And of course, the police backed off. And the Nigerian ex-president then told the men that if they didn't come to agreement in three days, he was going to turn the talks over to the women. Well, the men finally concluded an agreement which included the exile of Charles Taylor to Nigeria. Peace returned to Liberia, and in the next election, with the women's crucial votes, Dr. Ellen Johnson Sirleaf became the first woman elected president of an African country. <laughs> Lee Megabawi, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, and the Yemeni woman human rights activist, Tawakul Karman, won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2011. Charles Taylor was tried for his crimes and convicted and he'll likely spend the rest of his life in prison. To end genocide, and we can end genocide, to end genocide it will take love that transcends these boundaries that Paul was talking about, because love is the most powerful force on earth. It will take a love that can allow us to feel the suffering of people, even as far away as the Nuba Mountains in Sudan. To end genocide, it will take justice that tries the serial killers that commit genocide. We should never lose hope in the power of love, because love is God's force personally expressed. And we must never lose faith in the power of justice because justice is God's force socially expressed. With love and justice, we can end genocide. Love is stronger than hate. Justice is stronger than genocide. And life is stronger than death.
Uh, well, we have 10 minutes left, um, so we'll open up now for questions. I would remind everyone to keep it extremely brief. This is not a time for statements. Um, this is the time to, to ask questions. Um, all these men represent uh, various different areas of research they've done and, and different things they've done and work in the past. Uh, it's a very diverse group that has a lot of knowledge. Um, so let's open up for questions, and if not, I have some. Yeah, get a microphone. <laughs> I was a uh, brief comment. I was very moved by the love thing, and I just don't want to, but the, my question is not related to that. <laughs> uh, one of the uh, ability, the Mr. Slovak's discussion on people's un inability to respond uh, to a genocide is because of the complexity of some of the solutions. Uh, according to Mohammed Yahya, uh, a Mosulet spokesman several years ago, he was asked at a conference if the Sudanese resistance received effective aid, how soon could they end the genocide? And he answered, within a week. And the whole audience stood up and cheered. I think effective aid to the resistance. Uh, with, uh, uh, you mentioned airstrikes. Airstrikes cost 500, uh, air, no fly zone cost $500 million a week. Uh, Stinger missiles cost $50 million a year. Uh, 10 times less in a year than they would. So there are direct, consequential military solutions to add justice in some cases, which can end a genocide powered by air power. And I would just like to see if you, you think that may get, break people through. This is to Mr. Slovak, even though I was very moved by Fred's, uh, Gregory's uh, talk, but Mr. Slovak, if you could say if we could if that could break through some of the hesitation of people by, who get bogged down in these complicated solutions. Uh, very clearly, um, I mean, you can, you can move people uh, briefly uh, I mean, uh, before they get distracted and start worrying about something else. They have to have somewhere to go with that uh, emotion that you, and the problem has been that, that it hasn't been clear. Uh, there hasn't been a clear path for people then to, uh, to do something effective, and I think you're absolutely right that that uh, uh, without a sense of efficacy, uh, then it wears down rather quickly and, and you lose it. So, it, to the extent that what you're proposing is is uh, seen as a as an effective path, that would be a motivator, sure. Right, right over here. Um, one of the things that that we remember about the Holocaust. Uh, with the Nazi regime and America's lack of involvement, lack of response, it was until it hit our own shores. 9-11 um, hit our own shores and we have somehow or another not made adequately the connection between Sudan and our own attack and uh, I think that that's something that's missing. I'd like to hear what uh, the panel thinks about how we might more effectively connect Sudan to the greater uh, terrorist uh, problem we have because it is the most terrorist regime on the planet. Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, the, uh, the Darfur Action Group Cornell's uh, paper talks about a terror-inducing regime. One of the things that I've, I've heard quite a bit here uh, might allow us to play upon that, Slater, and that is that, in fact, terrorists uh, from Mali, basically jihadists from various uh, Al Qaeda branches and so forth in uh, Northwest Africa and the Maghreb, have come to uh, Darfur and have come to the new mountains. I heard two locations today. That could be played upon, it seems to me, and we could uh, talk to the uh, to the State Department about the contradictions in <laughs> their operations and so forth, since they are protecting a government which is allowing this kind of breeding and further training and experience. Uh, by fighting of a bunch of jihadis who might reach out to uh, American shores. So that seemed to be uh, one positive way to do it. The, uh, the other one is, of course, nuclear terror uh, in the sense that uh, Sudan is a great uh, ally and cooperator with uh, Iran's attempts to uh, help uh, Hamas and Hezbollah. And that's another place where we might, in fact, just sort of talk to uh, the State Department and say, have you guys put together various pieces of your uh, of your policy, has anybody met? Because one of the things that has come up 
uh, for the last several years, been very well described, it was described here today, is this whole stove piping phenomenon. You got a problem here, a problem here, and they never talk to each other, they never compare. And it seems to me that has not happened. We were able to find out that, in fact, that had happened uh, at all with, uh, with, in fact, connecting what was going on in, uh, in the Maghreb with in Sudan from, from the beginning. So everybody's got their own office. So that's another thing that might be uh, played upon as well, as well as the general idea of you know, what is terror uh, that comes up as well. But I, I would say that, uh, uh, that that gives us two, uh, two ways, it seems to me, to uh, do it uh, as well. Also, when I went to uh, uh, Syracuse on this bicycle ride and so forth, and I talked to uh, Sudanese in Syracuse, and uh, yeah, they, uh, they felt that uh, there had been an impact uh, anyway upon the uh, Sudanese government, upon Khartoum, uh, they felt uh, uh, of the attack on Afghanistan in the sense that they, they felt that uh, Khartoum was a little worried that Bush might turn on them uh, and so forth. But, uh, you know, they didn't know about the various kinds of arrangements that had been made to use the intelligence coming from uh, Khartoum at the time. Uh, nevertheless, that whole sort of role of the lessons of the, uh, of the war on terror is, is one. And I think, by the way, what hasn't been said today is I think we have an opportune time here to act uh, in the sense that we have Bashir in health problems, which has caused all kinds of frantic uh, maneuvering for about the succession. Uh, we, we have, uh, you know, the regime itself in some economic troubles. So, and we have uh, signs of real organization and unity in the opposition groups, as was demonstrated to us today. You know, this may be a window of opportunity. Yeah. Um, Paul, do you want to say something yeah, I think the, the terror aspect uh, goes uh, two ways. One, uh, to the extent that, that uh, we see our, our uh, self-interest being, being threatened by the destabilization in, uh, say, Sudan, then, then we can link what's going on there to our national interest, and, and that would be a more effective motivator. On the other hand, I think that, that uh, uh, Terrorism is uh, so spooks us that, that it far trumps uh, human rights, that we violate human rights, and we've done that repeatedly in the last decade, in, in the interest of fighting uh, terrorism, many uh, instances. So I think that uh, <clears throat> the fact that there's hundreds of thousands of people in jeopardy in uh, the Nuba region, uh, uh, we, don't, we, won't, we won't trade uh, any chance of, of maintaining kind of a you know, intelligence information from the government uh, in order to, to save those lives. It's not tradable. I mean, you, ordinarily in rational decision making, you think about trade-offs. You know, as the numbers of people in jeopardy increase, we should be willing to give up something. We don't give on national security, unfortunately. And I think it's a, a violation of rationality, rationality, but as long as it's not transparent, we don't, it's not easy to criticize that. Yeah, I think we have time for one more quick question and a quick answer. She was lined up over there, so we're going to... Uh, thank you very much. And I just would like a quick greeting for Professor John Wise in the middle. By the way, he's a guy who biking from USA, crossing up to Canada so early, 2006, to raise awareness about genocide in Darfur. Professor you John... The on the bridge that welcomed us. <laughs> Professor John is a well-known in Canada, by the way, as an American advocacy. Very much. I remember so early when he met us, he gave us a great advice. It was about maybe six months only we started advocacy in Canada. And he said, I worked with a Bosnian before, if you remember that professor. And he said they were so divided. Now you do Arforian, you look amazing, you are so united. But unfortunately, one month after that, we were never united again, even that five person group. So I hope all of you as a scholars, and, and the last speakers, you gave us a great speech about love. And that's the message we're going to take today with us. Thank you very much. You have experience with the people who advocate for genocide. And you know that sometimes the diaspora activists became center for power and became greedy for power. We, we how, are, we're how running we out of time, so that? if you can move to the question. How, 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 how we can find that through your experience? is not only you teach us how to lobby and how to sign petition, it's how to fight looking for power inside ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you. Greg, I think you could answer that probably pretty well. <laughs> I don't know that it After needs that speech. an answer. I, I, think, I think it's not, I think she was simply making an observation about human nature. I think that's right. You know, the capability to commit these crimes is in every single one of us. 
we all can be power hungry. We all can commit these crimes. We should never forget, for example, as Americans, that we in the United States also committed genocide against our own Native Americans, against African Americans who we brought over here as slaves. I mean, this is a country that should never get self-righteous about genocide. So we should always remember that. And we should remember any time we're in the opposition that we could get just as power hungry as the people we're trying to displace. So you're right. Yes. Uh, it's 5.15, so that concludes the scholars panel. Um, and then